So this morning it is Advent. Christmas is coming. Comes every year. And we've been looking at one Chronicles, haven't we? And we sort of finished looking at one Chronicles, looking life around the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant and its significant meaning that God is basically present within his people. Uh, his power and uh, whatever else. But these next following Sundays, because I'm speaking this Sunday, I'm speaking next Sunday, Sunday after that, Sunday the 24th, we have Pastor David speaking. You have me for three Sundays, you give him the chair. Anyway. <laughs> sort of gathered that would happen, it's fine. So, um, so I thought it would be really good that we would look at the Christmas story. So we'll start with Waitrose, and then next week we'll do, oh sorry. Now today we're going to look at uh, Zachariah's story. I'm going to uh, ask Ifra to come up. She's going to read to us Luke chapter 1, verse 1 to verse 10. Many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been... Oh, so I don't know what's going on. There you go. Many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. They used the eyewitness report circulating among us from the early disciples. Having carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I also have decided to write a careful account for you, most honourable... The the well done, that's it. <laughs> so you can be certain of the truth of everything you were taught. Um, the birth of John the Baptist. When Herod was king of Judea, there was a Jewish priest named Zechariah. He was a member of the priestly order of Abijah, and, had, and his wife Elizabeth were also from the priestly line of Aaron. Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous, in God's eye, careful to obey all of the Lord's commandments and righteousness. They had no children because Elizabeth, Elizabeth was unable to conceive and they were both very old. One day Zechariah was serving God in the temple for his order was on duty that week. As was the custom of the priest, he was chosen by Lot to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense. While the incense were being burned, a great crowd stood outside praying. Thank you. Timmy, sorry, the words weren't going up. They are on there, sorry. So, quick summary. Zachariah, priest. His wife, Elizabeth, also from priestly heritage. Big thing. Actually, that was quite a combination to have, culturally. That was a big thing. Verse 6, they were righteous in God's eyes, careful to do the Lord's commandments. These were pious people, highly religious, yes? Just like us, yeah? Verse 7, seven, verse 7, old but, and no children. So by cultural understanding, because they were righteous people, the culture would have understood, well, they should be blessed with children. And the fact that the Lord's not blessed them with children, then therefore there must be something, some secret sin that they're committing that is not known. And, I mean, clearly that's not true, but that was the understanding of the time. So therefore then you can imagine the shame that's involved. So on one level, they're up here. They are priests, priestly heritage, righteous people, Pious in God's sight, yet no children. Hmm, wonder what they're up to that we don't know about. So you can imagine the shame that they would be feeling. Imagine walking around inside, internally, with shame at your core. That's being laid on you, actually, by people, not by God, but by people, and you feel shame. It must be very hard sometimes to walk around just thinking, but we're doing the right thing. 
we are following the Lord. Anyway, verses 8 to 9. So it's customary for a team of priests to take their turn in serving in the temple. So you get like a, they were divided into, uh, into uh, 24, if my memory serves correctly, 24 people, and you'd get to take your rota. So it's almost like the porch and tea and coffee and the, it's that sort of rota, yeah? So you get to take your rota as a team of priests. You go in, into the, t- uh, there's an interesting imagery now I've got. As you walk out the tabernacle, would, would tea and coffee? Biscuit? Sorry. Sorry, my mind's gone somewhere now. Anyway, moving on. It must be the football yesterday. So, um, so you get these team of priests. So you're rotated to come and serve and do various duties around the temple. And one of those duties might be to go and burn incense at the incense, the altar of incense. Now, actually, this is not something you get rotated in to do by Steve Williams putting your name up against on the rotor. This is actually done by almost like drawing lots. And there uh, will be sort of decisions made by doing that. So a priest that was chosen would only have one turn at ever doing it in their entire lifetime. You only get one go at this. And some of them never actually got to do it. So you only ever got one go. So if you got chosen, if it was a great privilege, it was a great honour, wasn't it? You're suddenly realising that's what you're going to do. You're going to be able to be the person that lights the incense, and I'll come to what that is in a moment and what that represents. But you're able to do that. So initially what happens is your priestly order would walk in with you, your buds would walk in with you, yeah? And then after a while they do their bit and they'll all back out and leave you there for you then to be able to burn the incense. Others would be waiting outside. And the incense was a symbol of the prayers and intercession of the people outside becoming a fragrant, sweet fragrant offering up to the Lord. It's almost sort of a a transference, I would say, that almost those prayers becoming from the physical people praying them into almost like a spiritual moment, a supernatural moment of going up to God, yes? and sort of drifting through the curtains into where the the Ark of the Covenant is meant to reside, the Holy of Holies, and that's where it's meant to happen. So it's connecting with God. It's helping the people outside connect with God. Yeah? With me so far? So it's quite a big thing, isn't it? Because that priest, for that moment, is carrying that really important duty of carrying those people's prayers up and through. It's a big thing, isn't it? We now have Jesus doing that for us. We have the Holy Spirit living in us to do that, but we'll come to that moment. But you can imagine the big deal should you get chosen. Be massive, wouldn't it? So I just want you to put yourself in Zachariah's position right now. Okay, you might be a priest, you might be holy, but you know you carry around this sort of shame that people look at you a bit funny because you've not had any children. And then you get chosen to do... By the way, the prayers happened in the morning and in the evening, the incense burning. So, And he got chosen to do his rota. Couldn't believe it. Could you imagine suddenly getting chosen to do something that's really important for the entire nation? How would you feel if you suddenly got invited to do something really important that represented the nation? How would you feel? I'd feel quite sort of, whoa. Okay, this is a biggie, biggie. This is not something to take it lightly, yeah? But you'd feel quite, wow, I get to do this. And this is your only one occasion you get to do it. I don't know about you, but I'll polish my shoes for the first time. I'll buy a new suit. Wouldn't you? I'll, get, I'll justify getting a brand new waistcoat. But you'd make it right, wouldn't you? You'd, 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 oh, you'd make sure you scrub properly. Your hair was done right, yeah? I'd make sure I'd shave properly. But you would, it's a big thing. So imagine Zachariah. He would need to purify himself before he goes in with his, with his priestly order. But it would be a big thing. Big thing. So here, as he offers that incense up, It becomes a big thing. Marsha, could you come and read verse 11 to verse 17 for us? Verse 
While Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the incense altar. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him. But the angel said, Don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son, and you are to name him John. You will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. <coughs> for he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine or other alcoholic drinks. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even before his birth. And he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. He will be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. And he will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. Thank you. We could be so used to that story, but imagine walking in and you're about to burn that incense. So could, you, could you imagine yourself there doing that? You're about to do that and then an angel appears. Yeah? Are you with me? Okay. That's the physical side. I want us to take it from a heavenly viewpoint. You ready for this? Oh, yeah. All right. My name's Clarence. Good to see you. You're really about to witness the most amazing moment. Something really, really cool. Right. Here we go, lads. You ready, Gabriel? You all set up, mate? You're nearly on. You all right? Zachariah's about to go into the temple. Wow, this is cool. This is amazing. He hasn't got a clue what's about to hit him clueless all those mornings and evenings that he's been praying with him and his missus for children and he's about to get the answer but he hasn't got a clue how it's going to pan out could you imagine that you with me yes. oh it's clueless it's fantastic boy he's not going to believe what's going to hit him right between the eyes it's going to be fun isn't it gabriel you're all right old man of god that's what you're called aren't you yeah heads up how do you think he's going to react? Oh, I felt for him and Elizabeth. I really, really have. All those years they've been talked about behind their back. All those other women giggling in the corner, giving them sly looks. And he, 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 she can't have any children. Must be some sin. That's nasty, isn't it? Don't like people like that. There's no need for any of that. Well, they're going to be put to shame, aren't they? And Elizabeth's head is going to be held high in honour when she finds out what's happening to her. Oh, come on, Lord, let's get it on. This is going to be fun. As for Zachariah, did you see his reaction when the lot fell on him and he found out he was going to burn the incense? He was so gobsmacked. Oh, wasn't it so sweet to see his face? You can see it was a mixture of, oh, me? Oh, no, my one and only kind. And shock and worry and concern and joy and a sense of gratitude, eh? Oh, you know, I've been watching him really closely, him and Elizabeth. They're really righteous people. Do you know, they do exactly what the Lord wants. They, they try to follow all the commandments really well. Fantastic. I can't wait for this. He really thinks he knows how this is going to go on. They think this is the greatest day of Eve's life in more ways than he could possibly imagine. It's going to be great, isn't it? Yeah? Come on, angelic host, come with this on this one. So, Gabriel, how do you think he's going to take it, mate? I mean, you know, when you appear in all your glory. Wow. Now, don't forget, you've got to say those immortal words. Don't be afraid. <sighs> do you remember how Daniel reacted when you arrived? Oh, straight on his knees. Didn't know what else to do. I mean, I can understand that. We do look a bit magnificent, don't we? <laughs> but he had to sort of say, don't be afraid. And, oh, yeah, don't forget the name, Gabriel. It's John. I know I wanted George, but apparently it's John. So make sure it's John. When Zachariah hears that message from the Lord and that promise of a child, I'm sure he's going to remember exactly what happened to Abraham and Sarah, isn't he? They got given a child in their old age. And I'm sure as a priest, he's going to remember that because he listens to that story tons every year. He's not going to react badly, is he? He's going to remember all of this. 
And when he's going to find out what this son of theirs is going to become, that this son of theirs, John, is going to announce the Lord's coming, the very Messiah that the people of Israel have been waiting for. He's not going to believe it, is he? Oh, Oh, he's going to react so well. He's going to go so fantastic. And to think this massive part that his son is going to play in announcing the Lord coming. Historic moment. And actually, when it dawns on Zachariah and Elizabeth later on, they're going to realise the massive part they've got to play in this historic moment. Because they're going to have to bring John up in the ways of the Lord. They're really going to have a responsibility to make sure they follow those commands. Oh, but they're going to be so fun. Oh, Zachariah's going to absolutely be praising God, isn't he, in a minute? He's, you're not going to be out, shut him up. Off you go, Gabriel. Go on, mate, hurry up. I've been looking forward to this for a few millennia now. Come on, let's go. So, verse 18 states, Then Zachariah said to the angel, How can I sure be sure that this will happen? I'm an old man now, and my wife is also well along in years. What are you doing, Zachariah? Don't do that. Don't ask for a sign from a cynical viewpoint. What are you doing? It's all right to ask for a sign when you're being humble, but you're being really cynical. You've got an angel standing there for crying out loud. What's your problem? It's plainly obvious, isn't it? This has got to be of God. And yet you're asking, how can I be sure? Really? Give me a break. How could you be saying that? Don't do it cynically. You know, this is God we're talking about. Why? Why? What is it with you humans, eh? Seriously. You've got all these promises. You've got the promises of eternal life. You've got the promises that God is with you. Yet you seem to always walk around on edge. You've got promises, do not be afraid, for I am with you. And yet, you do, you walk around with a sense of nervousness. Is God really with me? I'm not quite sure. He is. He's with you all the time. Oh, you can't wait until his son comes. Oh my life, it's going to be so different. When the Holy Spirit comes in upon you, and each and resides in each and every one of you has accepted Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, Boy, oh boy, oh boy, it's like the biggest Christmas present. Oh, you don't know what Christmas is yet. You'll, don't worry about it. You'll find out in a few months' time. But when Christmas comes, it's going to be the biggest present ever. And yet, you walk around worrying about your reputation and what people think of you. Why? God is with you. There is no shame anymore. So why Zachariah reacted that way? Oh, come on. So humans, we take daily life forgetting that God is with you. He's with you day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute, second by second. I think that's cool, don't you? You have the ability to tap into the supernatural on a daily basis. You have direct communication with the very Lord himself, the creator of the universe, the sustainer. The majesty of all. And yet, you seem to worry about the most daftest things. How do you do that? God is with you. Amen? Amen. Well, Zachariah, oh, I can't believe it. This could have gone so much easier for him. Do you know what I mean? So much for not being able to shut him up. He's going to be shut up for nine months now. Marsha. Then the angel said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God. It was he who sent me to bring you this good news. But now, since you didn't believe what I said, You'll be silent and unable to speak until the child is born. For my words will certainly be fulfilled at the proper time. Well, I think Elizabeth's going to be happy. She's going to have a silent husband for nine months. A bit of all right, isn't it, eh? 
There'd be a number of wives that like that idea, yeah? Well, a bit later on, we're going to have Mary, about six months now, we're going to have Mary come along. Now, I bet she's going to get it right, isn't she? I mean, he, you know, Zachariah, he was part of the priestly order. And he should have known better, really. He was right in the midst of it all the time. He should have known it all. Mary's not. She's this girl about 12. You know what I mean? She's not going to quite get it right. We're going to see how she reacts. I'm going to be interested to see that. How about you? Yeah, you'll have to come back next week for that one. (laughs) Well, there you go. Ifra. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zachariah to come out of the sanctuary, wondering why he was taking so long. When he finally did come out, he couldn't speak to them. Then they realised from his gestures and his silence that he must have seen a vision in the sanctuary. When Zachariah's week of service in the temple was over, he returned home. Soon afterwards, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and went into seclusion for five months. How, how kind the Lord is, she explained. He has taken away my disgrace of having no children. Thank you. Clarence may or may not return next week. It's the Lord's will. I actually want to note something about all of that in the part of the humour behind all of that is that it fascinates me, our reactions to when God is doing stuff. We can do it very cynically at times. Some of us can leap into massive moments of faith and just get on with it. But generally on the whole, we sort of, I believe in testing the spirits, but that's when you test it humbly, searching God, searching what God's doing through reading scripture and for trusted fellow Christians who can advise you and tell you the truth when you probably don't want to hear it. But here, Zachariah was just plain, downright cynical. I suppose life of shame, maybe, you can take your own imaginations, had just made him cynical. He'd been praying so often that he'd become cynical. He probably thought God's never going to answer that prayer over wanting a child. And what fascinates me for that is, as, as, as hopefully I said it, Clarence was saying, you know, but I feel like I've just become split personality. But as Clarence was saying, you know, um, he doesn't know why there was a delay. But sometimes God does delay an answer, the one that we want. And there's other times the answer is just a flat no. And we have to accept that for whatever reason. But what most certainly we shouldn't be doing is being cynical about God coming, God doing something, God suddenly appearing and changing, you know, appearing in the respect of doing something. We should be forever expectant of that to happen. Now, this is the bit I love the most, and I've never noticed this before in all the story until now. When Zachariah's week of service in the temple was over, he returned home. Verse 23, when Zachariah's week of service in the temple was over, he returned home. He had this amazing moment, yeah? He couldn't speak anymore. Yet, did they let him off the the rest of his week of service? No, he carried on. He went back to, for want of a better phrasing, back to the rota, back to routine, back to normal life. I think it's quite something, don't you? It doesn't state in there, you know, what they did was they stacked Zachariah to one side on some holy pedestal and went up to him and went, oh, Zachariah, tell us everything by sign language, please, of exactly what happened. And they clearly did explain it, but it wasn't like a whole bunch of pilgrims. They, oh, listen, we can make some money out of this. Go over to here to Zachariah. He'll tell you the visitation of the angel if you put up enough denier up. Denier up. Enough of those Roman coins in there, right? So... <laughs> Yeah? They didn't do that. Has he finished his work of service? Has he finished his normal duties? Has he got on with normal life? In other words, God is in the normal of life. Yes? 
I just thought that was something I'd never noticed before. So it wasn't like he could, can't speak now. Well, uh, home, I'll translate for you. I need a ventriloquist now. It's like, you would have thought they sent him home, wouldn't you? Or done something else. Or kept him around the temple for a lot longer. But no. Got to go home after you've done your duty. But you've got to finish your duties first. I just, something, just, that got me. That actually, during the normal work of life, the supernatural, what we call the supernatural, breaks through. And it's not really supernatural. God's always at work. It's just our problem is we just don't recognise it half the time. And we sometimes expect some road to Damascus moment. We expect some angel to appear. But he does it in the normal works of life, in the normal conversation. You could be having a conversation with someone and all of a sudden you realise that God's in this conversation. It's a God-ordained conversation, yes? So on this Advent, working towards Christmas, when we're all expectantly opening our presents, yes? Or opening up the cards that's going to have the gift cards in it, yeah? Or, oh, that's a lovely, oh, thank you for my present, the one that I asked you to get me and asked you to order on Amazon for me, or any other website that possibly is available, like Very, Wow, Cher, something around there. But on this walk, this Advent journey, I want to ask you for this year to almost expect the unexpected. To expect God to break into the conversations you're having. You know, for us as Christians, it's an amazing time to talk about Jesus. Because it is actually meant to be about Jesus, isn't it? Was um, a decision's been made. Um, at, at no, you know, we've got our parent toddler group, Noah's Ark. And actually, when you realise you've got 50 to odd, at various points in one day, you can have normally about 50 odd kids here and they're carers, yes? So we're going to have the Christmas tree up here. It's coming, by the way, this week. It's a church notice for later on, but it's coming next week. And Noah's Ark's going to have their little bit of their Christmas party. But they're not having Santa this year. There are no small children in the house, are they, that can understand me? Sorry, if you're an adult and you think Santa does exist, I'm about to break the rules. <laughs> Apologies now. Yeah, I'm sorry, Andy, I know. Look at his Christmas jumper, isn't it lovely? <laughs> But they're not going to have Santa this year. Why? Because we've discovered that last year, some people turned up for our candlelit carol service and they thought that Santa was going to be here. The message is getting mixed in our society between what Christmas is really about. We now have the opportunity to utilise this time to say what Christmas is really about. So be expectant for the unexpected to happen, for God to break in. You never know, you might have an angelic visit. You never know, but that's not what you should be looking for. What we should be looking for is those nuggets of conversations that the Holy Spirit is prompting us to have. Yes? Got prime opportunity. There's nothing wrong with Christmas decorations. There's nothing wrong with Christmas jumpers. There was a whole debate going on first thing this morning by the worship team about... Anyway, moving on. Um, but actually... Oh, Christmas penguins. Thanks, Jenny. Um, or, you know, the whole point being, though, but we use those to bounce into a conversation about what Christmas is really about. So on this Advent journey, don't be like Zachariah, cynical, critical... That wanting that one amazing moment and totally missing the point of that amazing moment. That's the thing with it. He got Lottie to go in to do that. He thought he was doing one thing, but there was something else amazing that was going to happen. Even bigger than what he thought, yes? And the same can happen for you. You could be organising all your family get-togethers over Christmas. And your friends round, yes? And your workplace Christmas do's. Those workplace amazing moments when the mobile phone can interrupt. No, but the, 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 those amazing, don't worry about it, it's fine. Those amazing moments 
of all those great parties you're looking forward to, yes? You're looking forward to stuffing yourself up, yes? There is something about gluttony, by the way, in the Bible. Just thought I'd mention it in passing, just in case you wasn't aware. Mind you, as I point that finger, there's three fingers pointing back this way. So, but the point being, those amazing moments where you think you're going for a great boogie and a party at some works do, is actually the place maybe that God's going to break in and say you're going to have these amazing moments and conversations. And you might be prophesying over someone. You could well be praying for healing for someone, yes? You could be just telling them that actually Christmas is really about Christ. Emmanuel, God with us here. Even when you're frantically worried about which Christmas present you're going to get someone, do not worry about those things. God wants to do vastly more important things than that. Yes? So I want on this Advent for our journey to be us expecting the unexpected, the supernatural. And I'm going to use that term because we could so run the Christmas event. <sighs> oh, well, it's Christmas. As I said, it's happened every year for whatever, for me, 47 years. Yeah? And we can make it the same old, same old. Please, let's not do that this year. Let us expect Christ to be doing something with us, for those around us and us. You gonna join me on that journey? Because God is present, yes? God is present, yes? I've gotta try and find a decent strap line that the presence of God is the best present you can get this Christmas. And God is already present. I want us to reflect on that for both ourselves and for those around us. I want you to give you a few minutes just to think about that. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.